Good morning. Will you stand and join us as we worship together? Checking one, two. Uh oh. Okay, technical difficulty with the first song. So, I tell you what, while we are resetting, let me just welcome you to Grace Baptist Church. How about that? Thanks for joining us this morning. If you are a guest or a visitor with us, um, we have the bulletins outside as you came in, and um, on the inside perforation of it, there's a little. Uh, tear out section if you wouldn't mind filling that out and leaving it in your chair or dropping it dropping it in the offering plate in the back on your way out uh, that would be fantastic and then that would just uh, give us a record of your visit this um, with us this week and somebody from the church will contact you this week and just to touch base and follow up with you do we have sound yet maybe yeah. Oh, he had his volume off. So with that, actually, let me pray, and then we'll begin. We'll continue our time of worship together this morning. Father, thanks for the time we can meet, and just uh, thank you for a, a body, a church family that loves you and is uh, drawn to you. Father, as we offer up our praises to you this morning, we pray that you would be honored and glorified, uh, you would be magnified, exalted, and Father, we would be drawn to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. I know. 
what a great promise we can claim that um, knowing uh, that God is aware and knows everything that's going on, all our ways are known to him and it all falls within his uh, sovereign plan and um, he meets our needs. Wherever it is that we're, we're struggling and wherever it is that we're, we're wrestling with, the joys that we have, all of this God is fully aware of and he meets us where we are so we can be drawn to him.
standing for the reading from God's Word will come, come from Psalm 119, verses 97 to 104. Psalm 119, 97 to 104. All right, Psalm 119, 97 through 104. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are, medit are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you for your way. Lord, thank you for your words. God, help us to hear them today from Pastor Jamie to speak through him. Give him the strength and the wisdom and, and help us to apply, apply what he's teaching uh, to us today. God, help us to apply it to our lives. Help us to love you and to love people. I say this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you
You would please turn to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 will be in verses 14 to 26. I don't know if anybody in here has had LASIK surgery. I have not, but uh, probably would have been a good candidate for it. Only problem with it now is I still need reading glasses, so I don't see a whole lot of use in when I'm going to need glasses anyway. Getting LASIK surgery, it's my understanding it's a fairly quick process. Uh, and that it has immediate results. It takes less than an hour, sometimes less than half an hour. You see immediate results, but as time goes on over the next three to six months, your vision has to stabilize it. During that time, it can fluctuate some. You can see halos or have some issues with your vision. In some rare cases, actually, you have to have a second surgery to complete what happened uh, in the first surgery. But the general process is the results are immediate, and then over time, your vision gets clearer. Well, this is the hope for us as Christians regarding our faith in Christ as well, that over time our faith in Jesus and obedience to him as our Lord will continually improve and stabilize, and we will begin to see more clearly. So this morning I'm going to address the issue of seeing clearly or spiritual clarity, progressive spiritual clarity, what we might call spiritual growth, as we work through Mark chapter 8, verses 14 to 26. This is following the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, We'll look at two different events. There's a boat ride after the feeding of the 4,000 where Jesus has a conversation with his disciples. We'll look at that. And then there's also the healing of a blind man. So if you'd please stand, I'll read chapter 8, verses 14 through 26. This is after the feeding of the 5,000. They had collected basketfuls full of bread. It says, now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand, or your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? And when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, Twelve. And the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets of pieces did you take up? And they said, Seven, And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. When he had spit on his eyes and laid hands on him, he said, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he, sent to, and he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. You can be seated. So there is a personal conversation with Jesus and his disciples and the healing of a blind man in which Jesus taught his disciples the importance of seeing him clearly and seeing things all, all things related to the kingdom clearly. So today I want you to see three truths concerning what we need to see in regard to Jesus and his kingdom. The first one is a bit of a warning. It's in verses 14 and 15. I want you to see clearly the temptation offered by the world. See clearly the temptation offered by the world. Look at verse 14. So they had had forgotten to bring bread and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. So somehow, after collecting seven basketfuls full of bread as leftovers, the disciples, who knew they were going to have to eat at some point, had climbed into the boat and only brought with them one loaf of, loaf of bread and had left the seven basketfuls there. What Jesus does is he simply uses the moment as a teaching moment. Verse 15, he says, He cautioned them, saying, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So Jesus says, You're discussing that you don't have anything to eat, and I'm telling you what you really need to be worried about and what you should be worried about is the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the bread. He was trying to use the moment to teach spiritual truth. Now, leaven was commonly used, of course, and bread, and it made it rise, and it was symbolic of sin and the nature of sin, that sin can both spread and grow as leaven does and bread. 
And so Jesus points out here two very specific groups of people, both of whom the, his disciples would have been very familiar with. The first was the Pharisees, and the second was Herod and his followers or his supporters. And their stamp was on the culture, especially Jewish culture, and it was non-debatable and, uh, and it was dangerous. There was at least four areas of concern, if we think about the Pharisees and Herod, that Jesus is trying to warn the disciples about when, it said, when he says, beware of the leaven, beware of the sin of Pharisees and Herod. For the Pharisees, first you had doctrinal error or heresy represented by their legalistic and works-based teachings on righteousness, which Jesus had talked about many times. The Pharisees had a works-based theology that did not promote people to trust God or have faith in God, but instead to trust in themselves and trusting in yourself offers no hope or absolution for sin. So it was a dead end road. Secondly, the Pharisees represented blatant hypocrisy. They put expectations on others while not holding themselves to the same standards. And on top of that, themselves, they did not even adequately follow the clear law of God. Instead, they were concerned about the laws that had been established over the years that weren't written actually in the scriptures. So you had hypocrisy. When you think about Herod, he represented rampant immorality. If you remember, Herod took his wife from his brother, and his wife was also his niece, and so he was also known to be very indulgent and fleshly, a very indulgent and fleshly man. So Herod represents rampant immorality. Herod also represents a thirst for power. He would do anything to keep his position of power. We saw that when he had John the Baptist arrested for preaching against him, and also eventually had John the Baptist beheaded, not because he really wanted to, he actually liked John, but because he was afraid of losing respect in his position of power. So there's the thirst for power. Now when you look at these four areas again, you'll see some key elements of worldly thinking today that spread rapidly and unfortunately even tempt many Christians and churches to embrace. Look at, look at these four again and think about ourselves and churches in general. First, there is doctrinal error. The amount of biblical misinformation and misrepresentation today is staggering. Maybe only more surprising is the people's willingness to follow it, simply because they gain some kind of experience or they have some kind of feelings. But there is a minimizing of theology and doctrine in the church. Then you have blatant hypocrisy. This is the willingness of self-proclaimed Christians to wag their fingers at other people or even each other while not confronting sin within and among themselves. So they're more than willing to point out the sin of others, but no responsibility or no desire to take care of the sin in themselves. Along those lines, even within the church, you have rampant immorality. Every day it seems like we hear of Christians, both popular Christians who may be famous culturally, or even people that we have known that don't just fall into immorality or have a uh, a lapse in morality where they make a mistake, but we find out that who they have been over the past years is not who we thought we are, and they've actually been living separate lives of immorality for, year. Unfortunately, for years. Unfortunately, it's become more and more common. And then we have a thirst for power. And I actually believe this is probably the most dangerous one in our culture today because Christians everywhere have fallen into the trap and the lie of believing that we have to possess worldly power and influence if God's kingdom is to flourish and move forward. Christians have somehow bought into the idea that if we are not in control, if we are not in the majority, if things don't go our way when it comes to leadership and politics, somehow God's kingdom is going to slow down or stop or be steered in a different direction. And so there's this thirst for power because we think that's really where the hope is, and that's really what we need to get done what God wants to get done. Now, each of these worldly pursuits makes idols for us and puts them in a place that only Jesus belongs, puts them in a place of objects of worship. And in some way, all of these things deny key attributes of Christ. They deny his identity or his finished work on the cross and the resurrection. They deny his power. They deny his holiness. They deny his authority. They deny his sovereignty. Instead, what we should be doing is simply trusting Christ and not pursuing the things, the ideas, and the hopes and concerns of the world. The Apostle John warned us of worldliness in 1 John chapter 2. He said, Do not love the world for the things in the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So what the world finds, and we're talking about non-Christian people, what they find satisfying and fascinating and what they believe will give them security and hope, that is what they chase. And so they chase dollars, and they chase relationships, and they chase experiences, all right? And we would even say that maybe they chase some things that aren't inherently sinful, but that is where they're seeking to find their joy, and that is where they're seeking to find their hope, and that is where they're seeking to find their purpose, all right? And so then it becomes sinful because it becomes idols. So for us who are Christians, we are not to do this. We are not to find our hope, our security, our love, our purpose, our joy, any of that, in anything outside of Christ himself and his purposes and his kingdom. And then John, in those same verses, in verse 17, gives another good reason not to be tempted by the world, one that we often forget. Listen to verse 17 again. He says, The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, I would just tell you, it seems to me that it's wise counsel not to chase things that are temporary. And not to base your entire existence on those things that are temporary, that they are fading away. If you base your entire existence on your health or your money or relationships, all of those things are temporary. And they can be taken from you in a moment. So we should be chasing those things which are eternal, which cannot be taken from us. This is the conclusion that Solomon comes to in Ecclesiastes after allowing himself to experience any and everything he wanted, food and drink and women and parties. He says this at the end. He says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, the problem with the temptations of the world, be they overtly sinful Temptations are ones that are more covert, and I would say probably the ones for us that are more covert are the ones that are a little more uh, dangerous, is that they don't just show up in front of us as something evil. They come to us and they begin to creep in gradually. They creep in a little bit at a time so that we don't notice them. Now I want you to imagine someone is trying to kill you. At least I hope you're imagining this and it's not actually true. All right, Someone is trying to kill you. They're going to kill you with poison. They're going to give you a little bit at a time until it's too late. Your organs will shut down and you will die. And so they give you a little bit over and over and over. And they would probably hide it in your food, maybe your favorite food, probably something that you enjoyed every day, like your morning coffee. Okay, so this is what the world does. It hides hides little bits of uh, false theology, false thinking, Little bits of temptation over time, every day it begins to creep in. And it has multiple ways of doing it now. Multiple ways of of influence in us. Okay. Now here's the problem. I said, what if you knew somebody was trying to kill you? And what if you knew they were going to do it by poison? What would you do? You would be extremely cautious. Okay. You You would test or watch everything that you ate. If there was a test that you could... Test your coffee every morning to make sure there wasn't any poison in it. You would do that. You would be careful. You would be watching out. Somebody's trying to kill me. Somebody's trying to hurt me. They're trying to damage me. I have to keep my eyes open. Well, this should be the posture of Christians in the world today. The devil is like a roaring lion. He is not seeking to maim you. The Bible says he is seeking to destroy you. Okay? And he's not going to come at you and say, I'm here to destroy you. He's going to creep in. And so you constantly have to keep your guard up and what you watch and who you listen to and what you, what you process and how you view what's going on in the world. Never underestimate your ability, even, even as a follower of Christ, and I would even say as a serious follower of Christ, to be tempted by the passions that the, world's, that the world offers, be it attitudes or actions or thoughts or belief systems or philosophies. This is why Paul had to warn the Romans Not to conform to the world in Romans chapter 12, but to be transformed in the renewing of our mind. Because he knew that he's writing to Christians, but they could even be conformed to the thinking of the world if they weren't careful. And so you are either being conformed to the world, or you're purposely being transformed 
continually by the gospel. We have to learn to see clearly the temptations before us, to know where the dangers are. He even warned Timothy. He said that some people have an appearance of godliness, but denying its power, he should avoid such people. So there are people that on the surface look very spiritual, and they're pastors, and they're teachers, and they're friends, and they're families, and they look very spiritual. But when you start to dig into what they believe, and their philosophies, and what they're living for, and really where their hope is, you find that at the, at they may in fact not be believers at all, or their faith is very surface level. They have an appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. Timothy, or Paul told Timothy, avoid such people. And then 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us, test everything. Everything. Now, I don't want to put you in a, in a constant state of alarm, okay? But we need to be way more observant as Christians, all right? Just because, especially, and I would, and I'm, look, I'm just going to say it. If you listen to conservative, what we would call conservative Christian news, that doesn't mean Christian news. All right? If you listen to conservative political news, that doesn't mean Christian news because it has a conservative label on it, or the person claims to be a conservative doesn't mean when something comes out of their mouth, it's actually biblical. It, it could be actually the opposite of biblical truth. We have to question everything, everybody. Question me. I have no problems with this. I have no issues with you questioning, hey, I wonder if this is what he's saying is true and, and working through it yourself. I would encourage you to do that. In, in fact, I would say that's your obligation as a follower of Jesus to keep, keep your own beliefs in check and keep me in check even as a pastor. But, but listen, your thinking is going to, you're going to think one way or the other. You're going to think like Christ, you're going to think like the world. And you need to understand that the world is using television, news, it's using social media, it's using the people you work with, it's using people that look good, sound good, they look like you, they think like you in a lot of ways to negatively influence your thinking and to take you away from thinking like you need to, as a Christian, to, to thinking like you are, like, like the world does. And you just need to be aware of it. Secondly, we need to see clearly your own lack of faith and spiritual deficiencies. We are unfortunately often completely oblivious of our moments of lack of faith. And we are not very self-aware at times regarding our own, phys or our own spiritual deficiencies. I look at the conversation here between Jesus and the disciples. Look at verse 16. It says, They began discussing with one another the fact they had no bread. Now let's go back up to verse 14. They realize they don't have it, didn't bring but one loaf of bread. Jesus is trying to lead it into a spiritual discussion. He says, watch out, beware of the leaven, leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And the disciples go right back in verse 16 and keep talking about they have no bread. So Jesus says, what you really need to be concerned about is spiritual reality. And they look at each other and go, we still don't have any bread. They're, complete, they're completely missing it. They seem to pass right by Jesus' words in verse 15 and keep talking about how they don't have any bread, which is exactly what we do as Christians. Here Christ is trying to transform us spiritually, transform us into his image, help us to think more deeply about what's going on in our own life, what's going on in the world from a kingdom perspective, and all we can do is look around and say, we have no bread. The time of the church keeps changing. Now i got to wear masks in stores again. Now everybody's supposed to stay apart. Look what's happening in schools. Jesus is saying there's deeper things going on here. There's stuff I want to do in your life spiritually. There's ways I want to transform you. Jesus, did you see the sign I have to wear a mask again? It's like we're, we're just like the disciples. We have no bread. This is a big deal. We have no bread. And Jesus said, no, there's bigger issues here. And they're still arguing. We have no bread. Instead of them stopping and saying, wait a minute, first of all, the Son of God is with us. We've seen what he can do with one loaf of bread. We ought to be okay. But completely missing the point of what Jesus is trying to reveal to them spiritually. So here's what he does in verses 17 to 21. Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets did, I, did you take up? And they said, 12. 
He said, when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets did you take up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Jesus is referring back here to the sinful tendencies of the nation of Israel in Ezekiel chapter 12, where God told Ezekiel, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. You dwell in the midst of a rebellious house. What does this rebellious house look like? They have eyes to see, but they see not. They have ears to hear, but they hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Danny Aiken said the conversation with Jesus and his disciples went something like this. Jesus said, why are you discussing that you have no bread? And the disciples said, uh, well, Jesus says, don't you understand or comprehend? No. Is your heart hardened? Yes. Do you have eyes and not see? Yes. Do you have ears and not hear? Yes. Do you not remember? Apparently not. When I broke the five loaves for 5,000, how many basketful of pieces did you collect? Uh, 12. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls did you collect? Uh, seven. Don't you understand yet? Apparently not. He keeps bombarding them with questions. It's inconceivable how they could be wasting time talking or even arguing about the fact that they don't have enough bread when, number one, Jesus is in the boat and has already proven what he can do twice with bread. And secondly, he's trying to teach them deeper spiritual truths and they are completely bypassing it. Now, I want you to notice the way that Jesus points out their lack of faith. I think this is really important. He uses questions. He uses probing, thoughtful, and sometimes confrontational questions, which is personally one of my favorite ways to teach. And even personally for me, it's one of the ways that I learn the best, and that is being challenged by questions. None of us like to be told we're wrong. None of us like to be put on the defensive. But if I lower my defenses, I find that I can learn a great deal when I allow people to ask me questions, sometimes very difficult questions, so that they can, because they see, and we've talked about this many times, they see my blind spots better than I see my blind spots. And so one of the best ways that we can grow spiritually is to allow people to ask us very tough questions without being offended. Okay, especially if it's a Christian brother or sister in Christ who loves you and cares about you and they come and they ask you a question, our first instinct should not be to swell up and get, get defensive and who are they to question me. If there's a spiritual concern about it, our first instinct should actually be, well, let me, let me think about that. Maybe that's a good question. Maybe they see something I don't see. But we, get, we take it so personally and we get, we get so defensive. But we all have blind spots. Everybody here has them. When you're driving in the car... All right, you have blind spots. You're told to check your blind spot. So I'm driving down the road, and I'm told, check my blind spot. Okay, that's what I tell myself when I'm changing lanes. So I check my blind spots. Now, I'm trying to see all around me. I'm checking my blind spots. That's what I'm supposed to do, and I'm pretty effective, and I'm pretty comfortable, okay, doing that. But I'm a lot more comfortable when I have this person, my little helper in the car, Pam, sitting next to me, all right? So she's sitting next to me, and I check my blind spots, but then I tell her, hey, can you make sure there's nothing coming? And sometimes she's like, oh, yeah, you're clear. Go ahead. But sometimes she looks and didn't see something I, I, see something I missed, or there's a car coming up extremely quickly. And she says, no, 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 you need to wait. Okay? I'm actually more comfortable not checking my blind spots and getting her to check them other than me. Why? Because she sees them clearer than I do. Now, we can look for our own blind spots, and we should, and many of us do. I think many of us want to be open and try to find out where our blind spots are, but it is much more effective to have brothers and sisters in Christ who are biblically faithful, who love Jesus and serve him to help us. And getting their perspective is often better than our own. So we need to be more open and not just accepting it when people come to us, but asking it. Actually get comfortable with telling people, question me. Ask me the tough questions. What do you see that's not healthy? Where do you see areas in my life that's are, that are disobedient? I'm not going to get offended. I'm not, I, I want to know if there's some way I'm not being faithful and obedient to Christ so that I can be versus getting defensive. I have now come to the conclusion that one of the greatest inhibitors of spiritual growth in Christians is the tendency to be too quickly offended. 
Now, we look at the world and say, everybody gets so offended so easy. And then we turn around and we get offended so easy. All right? Best, quit getting offended. Proverbs 19.11 says it's to your benefit to overlook an offense. If somebody's coming to you for spiritual reasons, they love you, they're pointing something out, there's no reason to be offended. I shouldn't be offended. I, I want you to point something out. Out. Now, that doesn't mean deep down inside I'm not squirming a little bit going, oh, I don't like this one bit. That's normal. But if we're going to grow spiritually, we have to allow other people to point out our blind spots. So we need to see clearly our own lack of faith and spiritual deficiencies, and we invite others to help us in that, especially invite them to ask us tough questions. It's a key part of that process. And I will tell you what happens to here is what will happen to if If you're a person who has a difficult time with this. And every time somebody confronts you, you get offended about something, you know what's going to happen? You're not going to grow spiritually as well. You know why? People are going to quit coming to you. They're going to quit coming. Uh, people learn very quick. They're just not interested. They just don't want to hear it. So they stop. I can even tell you as a pastor, over 20 years, you know, over 20 years, sometimes you, you find out, you know, you're, you're talking and you give people counsel and then it, it's like, okay, then I'm, I'm just, it's, it's not personal. It's just like, they're not interested. They're not interested. And instead of pushing, which I used to do, now I just sort of back off and go, I've said all I can say. See clearly the progressive nature of sanctification. This is the third one. Now we move on to a separate event, but I believe Jesus is using this to teach his disciples and their inability to see the whole truth. Look at verses 22 and 26. It's a separate event. So they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid hands on him, he asked, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him home to his village, saying, Do not even enter the village." So some people bring a blind man to Jesus. They beg Jesus to heal him. Now, this does not say that the blind man was one of their friends. In fact, it's possible that these people just wanted to see Jesus perform a miracle, so they grabbed a blind man so that they could bring him to Jesus to see Jesus perform a miracle. So Jesus actually, in great compassion, moves the blind man out of the situation. He takes him out of the village and takes him away from everybody so he can deal just with him. And then it says he spit on his eyes. Now, why did he do that? I don't know. But my conclusion was this. I'd rather be spit on by Jesus than hugged by just about anybody else. All right? Now, we did talk about before when Jesus spit. That was sort of a sign in the culture of divine power. So perhaps he's communicating that. But he spits on him. And then he asks the man, do you see anything? And the man says, I do. I see people, but they look like trees. So either he had not been blind his whole life and he knew what trees looked like or just being blind and feeling, he had an idea of what trees may look like. And he says, yeah, these, I see people, but they kind of look like trees walking around. So he isn't quite seeing clearly. But then Jesus lays his hands on his eyes, and this time he opens them, and his sight is completely restored. And he probably told the man not to say anything because he knew that the people who wanted to see the miracle did not have pure motives. They just wanted to see him perform a miracle, and they weren't seeking Jesus for the right reasons. Now, it's not that Jesus could not heal this man completely at first. It's that he did not. All right? So we saw Jesus heal. We've seen Jesus at this point heal people completely first attempt. So it wasn't like Jesus spit on the man, covered his eyes, and said, oh, it didn't quite take. We're going to have to do this again. Why is he doing this? Remember what he told the disciples just a few, just a verse, couple verses back? He said, do you not yet understand? He was pointing out that while they had seen and embraced some truth, they had not seen and embraced it all. But one day they would. They hadn't yet, but one day they would. They saw Jesus sort of with a spiritual blur now. But one day for the apostles it would be complete. Once he died, was raised from the dead, and ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came. They would take the truth that they had accepted, and they would begin to build on it, which included writing the New Testament. So that's why he did this man in this way. It's right after this, this understanding of revealing to the disciples what is going on here. He says, can you see anything? And the man answered correctly. He said, yes, he could see, but he couldn't see clearly. So he acknowledged that he could see, but he also acknowledged 
that it wasn't perfect. So what does Jesus do? He builds on that acknowledgement. He gives him revelation. The man responds to it. Yes, I see. Responds to what he's not seeing clearly. And then Jesus honors that by covering his eyes back up and helping him see even more clearly. Let's take this account and see what we think about our own experience with Christ. Let's go back to even the beginning illustration I talked about with LASIK surgery. At salvation, Jesus spiritually spits on our eyes and we can see. Okay, We see the reality of our sin. We see the need for grace and salvation. We see the meaning of the cross that Christ died in our place. He paid our sin debt. We see that he was raised from the dead. We see the necessity of coming to Christ in faith, that it's not a works-based, it's simply trusting in Christ. There's nothing we can do. We see Jesus as Lord. There are not many ways to heaven. There are not many beliefs that get you to God. There is one, there is Christ, and there is Lord. And that may be it. That's very basic. But what does he do? He builds on that. And throughout our lives, we begin to see clearer his glory. We begin to know better how to serve him. We begin to grow in maturity. Things start to become clear. And every time we act on the revelation and the clarity that was given to us, he makes things even more clear. We say, yes, I see this in your word. I see this is, this is what we should do. I believe that. I'm going to act on that truth. And he honors it by putting his hands back over our eyes and lifting it again so that we can see more clearly. This is what he's showing us with this man. It's a lifelong process. Our spiritual vision will never be 2020 here on earth. One day it will be. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as, as I have been fully known. But even though we will never have 2020 spiritual vision here on earth, until we see Jesus, our vision can, our spiritual vision can continually improve in both what we believe and how we live out those lives and believe. In fact, I would say this. If you're kind of at a point where you say, uh, this has been my, at least my personal experience, where I just don't feel like I'm growing spiritually like I should. I don't feel like I'm, I'm where I need to be. Something's not right. Okay? I usually tell people, look backwards. There's probably something you know that you haven't acted on or you haven't been obedient to, or some truth of Scripture that you haven't applied. All right? That, that you've got a clog in the system, basically. And you're expecting to grow spiritually, but the last thing that God has called you to do, instructed you to do, you either missed it, or you refused, or in disobedience, or whatever it is, and so you're sort of stuck. Well, how do you unstuck it? You just go back and... Do what God called you to do. Yes, Jesus, I see what you want me to do. I'm doing it. Jesus then puts his hands back over your eyes and says, okay, then let's move forward. That's why I tell people, one of my phrases, it's my go-to phrases now, is just do the next right thing. Just do the next right thing God's called you to do. If you know it's what you're supposed to do, quit asking questions. Just do it. Just be obedient to it. That's all he's asking in the moment. It's for you to be obedient in the moment. Now, this idea of progressive sanctification or spiritual growth as a process is exactly why we have to be patient with each other. Because first of all, we're all growing progressively. Nobody here has arrived. Okay, We're all a part of this progressive sanctification. Secondly, we are all ahead of each other in some ways and behind in others. I can go to every person in this room who's a believer. And I will be able to point out ways, if we, have a, if we know each other or have, know enough about it or have a conversation, I will be able to point out ways that you are further along spiritually than I am. And it doesn't matter to me how long you've been a believer. You, I will find ways that you are, are ahead of me spiritually and I can learn from you. And you will find ways that I am, I guess, more mature spiritually in some areas and you can learn from me. That's why it's important to be around Christians. That's why it's important to be around each other. Nobody has arrived. The person that says everybody needs to be like me, that's a Pharisee. That's the person Paul told Timothy, avoid. All right, Avoid that person. But together, we realize we're all running our own race, and we look at each other only for the sake of learning from one another and being encouraged 
by one another. Which means we need to spur each other on to good works. Hebrews chapter 10 says, let us consider how to stir up one another. The word there actually means spur. It actually sort of means in jab. So, if, if, you know, so going back to asking the probing questions, you know, somebody asks you a probing question like, ow, that hurts. Well, that's part of being in a Christian family. We ask each other the tough questions. We probe each other a little bit. We poke each other a little bit to try and get, get to do the right, the right thing. Not neglecting to meet together, which means we have to be together. All right, this whole idea about, and I'm going to talk more about this in the future, but this whole idea about online church is crazy. It's, cra it's not biblical in any way, shape, or form. The actual word church means called out and gathered together. Now, I understand there was a time where a few months ago or about a year and a half ago, we didn't know what was going on. We shut down temporarily and stuff, but that's the church on crutches. So this idea that I can miss church, I can watch it online, I can, and, it, and it's the same, is completely false. Church was meant to be together. There is so much in Scripture you cannot do with each other unless you are together. So he says, don't neglect meeting together as is already the habit of some. So apparently this was not a new phenomenon. This is not a new phenomenon. This was going on back then. He said, but instead, encouraging one another. So we're... We're asking tough questions. We're poking each other a little bit, but we're doing it in an encouraging way. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. In other words, the closer it gets to Jesus coming back, we're going to need this more and more. Jesus says, do you not understand? And we say, no, we don't. But we see some things we want to see more. We want to see more. Act on what you know. Have people point out things in your life that are disobedient to Christ or concerning out of love. Accept that as what it is, concern and love. Grow in it, be obedient, and then move on, move forward. God will honor that. My hope for me personally, my family, and for us as a church is that we would ask God to help us and we would help each other do what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. If you'd bow your heads. We just ask some questions, if you're a follower of Jesus, for you to think about and pray about in this moment. One is, what temptations does the world offer you that you find difficult to resist? What do you find yourself chasing that the rest of the world chases for hope, for security? What's the most challenging area for you? Why are these things particularly tempting? What is the weakness? What is there that causes you to be tempted by these things? What areas in your life do you need to grow in trust and faith in Christ? Is there an area where you look back and go, you know, I haven't been obedient in that area yet. Could be sharing the gospel with somebody. Could be having a conversation with somebody. It could be some truth in scripture that you read that you haven't applied or put in it. But where is it that you said, I know what I'm supposed to do. I just have not done that. Why is it important to remain convinced of Jesus' grace in the process of sanctification? It's because we're all in process. That's the great thing about faith in Christ. That's the great thing about being in Christ and knowing you're forgiven is that when you do have these moments of clarity and you say, oh, I have not been obedient in these areas. I have sinned in these areas. You don't come to Jesus worried that he's going to strike you or condemn you. You come to Christ knowing he's already forgiven you. You're safe in him. And you just come and say, I'm sorry, I want to be obedient and you move forward. That's why the gospel is so important in the process of sanctification because we recognize it's a process that we're never going to fully complete, but we can strive forward. Why at times are you so hard on yourself when it comes to the process of sanctification but so patient with other people? And then the opposite, why are you so hard on other people sometimes but so patient with yourself? Most of us in here were error on one side or the other. Some of us in here are very difficult, hard on ourselves. We don't provide the same level of grace for ourselves that we do other people. And then some of us in here are very hard on others. And we provide a much higher level of grace for ourselves than we do other people.
And then, of course, the big question is, has Jesus revealed anything to you even the first time? Have you even got to the point yet where you are willing to accept him as the Son of God, crucified on the cross, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven to return again? Have you put your faith in Christ? Or are you still like the man here, blind? You don't see anything yet, not even basic things. Today can be the day that Jesus puts his hands on your eyes and reveals to you he is the Messiah, he is the truth, he is the only way to God to trust in him. And you may open your eyes and you may not see everything clearly. In fact, I will guarantee you do not. But you'll have enough to start and to begin to be obedient. And he will take it from there. And over the course of your life, help you to see him and his kingdom more clearly. Father, we thank you for your patience with us as we walk through this journey of life and sanctification. Forgive us when we fall, but help us to know, Lord, that under grace we can always run to you. We don't have to run from you or hide from you. Because of what Jesus has accomplished, we can run to you. Help us to be patient with each other. Help us to at times where we need to be, be patient with ourselves. Help us to be open, Lord, to accountability and tough questions. Help us to not be so, Lord, quick to be offended or angry when, when, we, get, when we talk to each other or, or have com- difficult conversations, but, Lord, just that we would calm down and, and say, okay, where is this for me spiritually and what do I need to do? And, and, Lord, that we would be people who desire to grow closer to you, even if it means we have to deal with issues that are difficult and hurtful. Because our desire is to be sanctified. Our desire is to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is, what, that is your purpose and your will for us. And so whether it's through relationships, questions, good times, bad times, difficulties, celebrations. Lord, we pray that you would bring us to that end. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd please stand as we sing. If I can pray with you or help you in any way, I'll be standing here at the front for just a few moments.
All right, just a couple announcements today. Uh, youth, we are going to uh, Turkey Run State Park next Saturday, this Saturday, excuse me, the 18th. Uh, we will meet here at 10 a.m. and uh, carpool out there and do a little six-mile uh, canoe trip down the river. Uh, if you got any questions, parents uh, or youth, uh, just come see me. Um, let's see, uh, next, uh, next Sunday as well, on the 19th, we're going to have our uh, uh, fall Sunday evening service. Pastor Jamie is going to be talking about uh, CRT and biblical racial reconciliation that night. It uh, be a great night to just to learn more about this and uh, how we as believers can uh, interact with people that believe in this way. And also, we uh, got men. We've got our golf annual, or excuse me, our golf outing coming up on the 2nd of October. It's going to be at Buffer Park uh, Golf Course. Uh, see uh, AJ Heck with uh, information on that. All the info is in the bulletin there for you. And then uh, let me pray and we will be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I just thank you uh, for this day, Lord. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, help us to, to follow you, Lord. Help us to uh, stop asking where the bre- where's the bread at. Lord, help us to, to seek after you. God, help us to follow you with all our hearts, mind, body, and soul. And help us give you glory in all that we do. God, I pray that you bless this week and help us to glorify you. God, I say it's in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.